Hey everybody, welcome. We are so glad that you're joining us today for the kickoff of a brand new teaching series called No Regrets. I'd like to welcome those of you who are joining us from Crossroads Church in Fremont, all of you who are part of the Echo family spread across the Bay Area, all over the country, and literally joining us all over the world. This is gonna be a great four weeks for us together because we're entering into some very important questions that we all have to wrestle through in the midst of crisis. You know, it's been surprising to me as I've talked to a lot of other friends who are pastors and even people who are part of our church to look at how many people have already made decisions eight weeks or nine weeks into this thing that they deeply regret. Habits that they've picked up, relationships maybe even that they've ruined. And we, we started on the front end of this. Jason and Lori, who are on our staff at the Sunnyvale campus, were on the front lines of the tsunami crisis in the early 2000s. And they learned a lot. And when we started, we got together as a staff on Zoom, of course. And he said, hey, um, one thing we learned in that crisis was that a lot of people came out of crisis with regret. So what if we as a team could come out with no regrets? That became a mantra for us as a church, as a staff. And it's really a mantra for us that we've just been wrestling through. In fact, we would love for you to join us in a no regrets challenge over the next four weeks and even to post online things that you're doing with the hashtag no regrets challenge. And we're gonna together look at how do we come through this crisis without regrets. Now, I don't know about you, but I'm seeing a lot of things in me that I don't like. Stacy, my wife said so beautifully last week that pressure reveals character. And today I wanna continue that thought because you're seeing in you what is already there. Perhaps you're seeing frustration with your kids. Maybe you're, you're seeing frustration with your parents. Perhaps even you're seeing a level of boredom that should not be there. But there, there are things inside of your character that are showing up. And maybe you're seeing good things. Maybe you're seeing yourself being more disciplined and you're making good choices. But pressure is revealing. Like, like Play-Doh, you know, when you pull Play-Doh out and you push on it, you see the substance for what it's worth by the pressure. So if I took this plastic and pushed it in, it's different than Play-Doh, pressure reveals. The other thing that pressure does though is pressure shapes. It shapes substance. So when I push down and I squeeze on the Play-Doh, it starts to look different. So you're looking different through this crisis. There are parts of your life that are changing in the midst of crisis. And I want to wrestle through a really important question. It's an overarching question for this whole series. And the question is, are you being conformed or transformed? See, being conformed is when on the outside, the pressure changes you. But conformed is changing from the inside out. The Apostle Paul made a statement in Romans chapter 12, verse 1 and 2. Very powerful passage of scripture. He writes this, long letter to a church, one of the early followers of Jesus, and he says, do not conform to the pattern of this world. So there is a pattern that we're seeing in the midst of crisis. It's fear, it's anxiety, it's, it's worry about the future, it's, it's making choices that we later regret. Do not be conformed, he says, to the pattern of this world, but be transformed by the renewing of your mind. It's an inside out process that your thought process, your heart is being changed. Be transformed by the renewing of your mind. Then you will be able to test and approve what God's will is, his good, pleasing, and perfect will. So we're gonna look for four weeks. How do you be transformed from the inside out? One of the ways that God most changes people is through pressure. It's through difficulty. Jesus said in John Chapter 16, to a group of his, his friends, right before he went to the cross, he said, in this world, you will have trouble, but take heart. I have overcome the world. So trouble, difficulty, crisis, pain, suffering are all a part of the human experience for every one of us. And God will use it to change you if you have the right perspective and you cooperate with him. So here are the four questions so you can know, so you can come back and join us here, same time, every week, next four weeks. Number one, we're gonna look this week, what am I fighting for? And I wanna give you this question to wrestle through. What, what are you gonna give your energy to, your passion to, your life to? What are you fighting for? To have a sense of purpose in the midst of crisis. Second week is who do I wanna be? 
when this is all over. A lot of us are thinking, what do I want to do? Am I going to go on vacation? What, what, what are we going to do with the kids? What, what job? But a better question is, who do I want to become on the back end of this, an identity question? And then what is my foundation, number three? And number four, what relationships are most important? Now, these four questions are going to give us a very solid framework to begin to wrestle through and take the challenge so that we come out with no regrets. Now today, as we wrestle through that first of the four questions, we're going to look at a story from the Old Testament. And we're going to go way back to 1000 BC. And I want you to imagine the scene with me for just a moment. David is the king of the nation of Israel. He's the second king. The first king, a guy by the name of Saul, has ruined his life. In fact, he made a lot of stupid decisions. And as a result, he was removed from leadership. And God came after this young man when he was a teenage boy. He was the youngest of multiple sons. And Samuel comes to Jesse, King David's father, to find the new king. Passes over all the brothers, thinks it's them, and finally gets to the last one. And God says, you're looking at all the wrong things. You're looking at outward appearance. I see the inside. I see the heart. And he chooses David to be his king based upon what's on the inside. He sees in him, he's, he's labeled, King David is labeled a man after God's own heart. When we pick up this story in 2 Samuel chapter 7, King David, he is on the mountaintop. He is about 50 years old. He's been successful. He's achieved everything that he could have want of, wanted to achieve with his career. He's defeated all of his enemies. He's built himself a nice house. He's living on the top of the hill. And in this story, something happens that becomes a defining moment for King David. It becomes a moment that changes the trajectory of the rest of his life. There is a whole bunch of pain and sorrow and regret that comes out of a series of choices that King David makes in 2 Samuel chapter 7, 1000 BC in the city of Jerusalem as the, as the king of one of the most powerful nations at the time. It begins and says like this, in the spring of the year when kings normally go out to war, David sent Joab and the Israelite army to fight the Ammonites. Now I want you to notice in this story, very clearly the author has articulated that the right thing to do for a king is to go off to battle. This is the time of year. And again, like there's a lot of stuff in the Bible that is very different than where we are today in the 21st century. And Jesus, you know, said in his teaching that when somebody strikes you on the cheek, you should turn the other cheek. And so we're not proponents of war. But in the Old Testament, there was a lot at play. And this was the time where kings, people who led nations, went off to battle. This is a crisis time. This is a time where a crisis is breaking out for the nation of Israel. And King David, at the time when his nation, when his men are in battle, off at war, watch what King David does in 2 Samuel chapter 11, excuse me, verse 2. It says, David sent Joab and the Israelite army to fight the Ab Ab Ammonites. They destroyed the Ammonites they destroyed the Ammonite army and laid siege to the city of Rabbah. Now they're winning battles and King David is not a part of it. So think about for just a moment what, what he was like at this, at this point in his career. He's at the top. He's built up a team. He has his 30 men, his mighty warriors. He has another hundred outside of them and they're powerful. They, they, they know how to implement and execute the vision without King David. They can do it. They can go off to battle, win a war. He doesn't even have to be present and the story in 2 Samuel chapter 11 says, however, David stayed behind in Jerusalem. This is the first of a series of choices that King David is going to make. His team, his, his group, his, his co-workers go off to battle in the midst of crisis, and David stays back in Jerusalem at his palace. And watch what happens when he stays back. It says, late one afternoon, after his midday rest. Now, there, there, we don't know exactly like how long of a nap this was. We don't know if it was like a siesta, which I'm led to believe based upon the context. It's the spring, and in the spring, it's not super hot in Jerusalem, so it's not like one of those, oh my gosh, we're dying because of heat. I need to take a nap. It was King David was at a place where he just is bored, and so in the middle of the afternoon, he's taking long naps. He's, 
He's watching Netflix. He's eating Ben and Jerry's ice cream. He's like not engaged at all. And he's just there taking his nap. And it says one day after his midday rest, David got out of his bed and he was walking on the roof of the palace. Now, at this point, King David had actually been to the place where they believe his palace was. It was on the top of a hill right next to where they would build the temple when Solomon would come. And later there would be kind of like a, a path from David's house to the temple. But down below David's house was, were all these other houses. It'd be like if you lived in the eastern foothills or western foothills of Silicon Valley and you could see all down below you. And David goes out on his rooftop. It's not like here where there's these kind of angled roofs. It's flat roofs. And he can look out from his roof down and he can see the rest of the city. It was a pretty cool view. It's actually still a pretty cool view today. But there's one issue. At this point, this is the time of day. Now, there's, again, a lot of debate on whether or not Bathsheba knows what she's doing. But at this point in the day, David is at the wrong place at the wrong time. He should be off in battle. He's at home. He's totally lost a sense of purpose. And he's walking on his rooftop. And the story says that when he, when he looks out, he looked out over the city and he noticed a woman of unusual beauty taking a bath. So David now has lost a sense of vision and purpose, and we're going to come to this whole progression in just a minute. He looks out. He sees this woman down there. His eyes are taken back by Bathsheba's beauty. But you have to know some very important things about Bathsheba. In the story, we're going to see in just a moment, David wants to know who she is, but David would have known who she was in the story. In fact, Uriah, one of King David's commanders and key army men, is Bathsheba's husband. And on top of that, he knows Bathsheba's dad. So watch what happens next. It says, so David sent someone to find out who she was. And he was told she is Bathsheba, the daughter of Elam. Now, Elam is important because Elam was one of King David's 30 inner mighty men. So this, this would be like a staff member of King David's, which means that Bathsheba is significantly younger than David. So David's about 50. Bathsheba's probably early 20s. Y'all, this is sick. This is abuse, abuse of power. This is abuse of, of his authority as a leader, what he's about to do. He is searching in on this woman. He's peeping Tom, watching her take a bath, and she's like a little bit older than a teenager. She might have even come to the palace when she was a little kid and bobbed on King David's leg and he you know, gave her high fives. And she might have even been friends with one of King David's kids. This is, it is, it is gross what David is about to do. It says, so um, David sent messengers to get her and bring her to the palace. And when she came to the palace, King David slept with her. Now it's going to get a little PG-13. If you really knew the story, it'd be R. I'm going to do my best to make it PG because I know we got some kids in the house today. But she came, she sleep, slept with him, and it says she had just completed her purification rites after her menstrual period, and then she went back home. Now, we don't have time today to go into the whole story. I want to encourage you to go back and read it. I just want to zero in on the choice that King David makes. So she goes back home. When she returns home, later Bathsheba discovered that she was pregnant, and she sent a message to David saying, I'm pregnant. I bought the test from Target, and I'm pregnant bad news. And David's life is completely transformed. Imagine being David getting that text message from Bathsheba, like, I'm pregnant. You made a choice. You brought me here. Some, some commentaries and historians actually believe that this was a form of rape. Regardless, it's some level of abuse on his part. And he completely takes advantage. Sure, she probably had something to do with it. Sure, we later see that she she's going to marry the guy and he is going to be a second kind of kick for David, you know, kind of round two of, of wives. But regardless, David is the one who makes the decision to bring her to the house. And he does a lot of other really bad stuff. But I, I want us to see very importantly, when it gets practical for us, it's easy to blame regret on an event. It's easy to say, oh, this ruined my life. 
But I want you to see regret is not an event. Regret is not one choice. It's not one action. In fact, regret is always a series of choices. Regret is always a domino effect. You do one thing, then you do another, then you do another. And this whole story is a stream. You can feel it. You can feel it from the moment that King David doesn't go into battle, goes up on his roof, gets her to come back to his house, sleeps with her. If you keep reading, this whole domino thing keeps going on and on and on and on. Now, grace of God intervenes. David completely repents at the end of the story and God is like he always is gracious, but there is a whole lot of pain. There is a whole lot, listen, of unnecessary suffering that David and his family endures because of this series of choices that he makes. And I want you, again, throw that point back up there for just a minute. Regret is not an event. Regret is a series of choices. And I want us to see the series of choices because we're making this series of choices in our lives. And the first aspect of this is David lost a sense of purpose. Purpose is the the beginning of moving towards regret when a person loses a sense of purpose. See, there are three types of people when it comes to COVID or any crisis or really in general with life. There are those who, who have completely lost a sense of fight. They have no sense of fight left in them. There are others who are fighting for the wrong thing, and then there are some people who are fighting for what matters most. And David is bored, he's apathetic, he's accomplished everything that he set out to accomplish, he's successful, probably a little bit arrogant, and he has lost that drive. He has lost the eye of the tiger. He's lost the rookie hunger and passion to be the man of God that God has called him to be, to keep pursuing God as a man after God's own heart. And purpose is the beginning of it. When you lose a sense of purpose, that's when regret begins. When you lose a reason for getting up, something to fight for every single day, there begins to be this series of choices that leads to regret. In fact, what happens next is that the purpose you choose determines the places you go. The purpose you choose determines the places you go, the sites you visit, the things that you're willing to engage with. You know, when you have a mission with your life, you don't stay up to 3 a.m. binge watching Tiger King on Netflix. When you have a sense of purpose about your life, it changes the places that you go. Now, I know that you're sheltered in place right now and you're not driving all around town or most of us are not driving all around town like we, we, we used to, but there are still places that people are going that they should not go. Y'all, uh, alcohol sales are up online 477% since COVID started. Porn, porn sites have seen an increase in 30% over the last eight weeks. People are, they are bored, sheltered in place, and we feel like all these decisions that we are making are contained in this small aspect of our life, and they're not gonna overflow into what happens after COVID. The choices you are making right now are drastically impacting the life that you will live after COVID. And you and I have to understand that when we have a sense of purpose, that purpose drives the places that we go. So you have purpose and place. And there's a domino. David ends up on the rooftop in the middle of the afternoon, starts with purpose, ends up at the wrong place. And the places that you go then will start to lead to the things that you begin to see. So the places you go now determine the things that you view or the things that you see. There are certain websites that you look at that put images into your brain and those images get stuck inside your mind and they become next the thing that you focus on. So you have this domino effect of purpose, place, then focus. So King David, now his eyes are drawn to Bathsheba. Who knows how many times he's been up on top of that, the, the rooftop and seen this woman. 
But now he's getting all these images. This is one of the things I talk to as I'm having conversations with my, my young boys who are one's a teenager, the other's becoming like, that's the, that's the problem with pornography. That's the problem, King David, with watching Bathsheba is that you see something, now it's stuck in your brain and you want it. So you're mulling over something that you should not have and you're focused on the wrong thing. It started with purpose. You lost your sense of what you were fighting for. You found yourself, and anywhere on this whole domino trail, David could have gotten off. He could have gotten out of the stream, and you can too. That's the good news is you can, you can identify, okay, I'm, I, my purpose is off. Now I'm at the wrong place. Now I'm viewing the wrong things, and here's an important point to write down. How you view things determines how you do things. So what you see, what you put in your mind the things you meditate on will determine what you do. So if you don't want to do certain things, you probably shouldn't view certain things. And David, David just is, this whole progression is pushing him towards massive regret. So he focuses on the wrong thing, and finally he takes the action and says, go get her and bring her back to my house. Y'all, I know this is a depressing story, because I think so many of us can relate to King David in his folly and his embracing just the mediocrity and the apathy of the situation. But it, eventually, that viewing Bathsheba leads to action on King David's part. And what happens is today's actions become tomorrow's habits. So the things that you keep choosing today eventually become tomorrow's habits habits. Now, if you go on a vacation, let's just go back pre-COVID, okay? And let's say that May was coming or June was, or June was coming and you're going to go on a family vacation and you decided that you would eat ice cream two times a day on family vacation for six days, okay? If you did that, you might put on two or three pounds in a week, which, you know, that's, I mean, that's not a ton of weight. It's a little bit of weight. But if you multiply those two to three pounds, by nine weeks, y'all, that's 27 pounds if you go three. And what we're seeing is a lot of us on the front end, we're like, well, you know, what, what do I do with my time? Well, I just watch more TV or I just, you know, binge watch or I w- go, to, go to these sites. I'm bored. I don't have a job. I don't do, and then all of a sudden you get up like eight or nine weeks down the road and you haven't invested in your marriage. You haven't invested in your kids. You've made stupid decisions with your character. And I'm not, I am the least, last thing I'm trying to do is make you feel bad. I'm trying to inspire you that there is more in you and you don't have to come out of this season with regret. And today can be the first day of the rest of a new life for you that you can pivot. Love how that word's been thrown out so much, pivot. That you can pivot direction. And I want you to see that these choices are producing in you habits. We've been in COVID-19 long enough. We've all picked up a few new habits, right? There are certain things that we've gotten ourselves addicted to or maybe we're doing more of. Some of those habits might be good habits. But I want you to see when it comes to habits, small bad habits cause big lifelong regrets. Small bad habits produce big lifetime regrets. And I wonder, what are those regrets for you? What are those things inside of you that you wish you could erase? I wonder if you would allow God to stir inside of your heart to help you realize that today, by the grace of God, you can rewrite your story. That today can be a new day for you. In fact, when I read this story of King David, There's a sadness I feel. Part of the sadness I feel is my own challenge as a leader because when I look at what God's done in, you know, 11 years of our history, look around, so much of it is far beyond anything that I would have imagined when I was 20, 25 years old. I mean, God has exceeded my expectations. I work with a great team. God's doing amazing things. We have an incredible dream team. They're serving amazing, doing, God's moving. And it's easy when we look at our lives sometimes and we've experienced a measure of success to stop fighting for what matters most. But what has happened for me in the midst of this season is I feel like the Holy Spirit has been drawing out of me this new level of passion for what we do as a church and a new level of 
passion for our, for our kids and my marriage and my character and this passion that would give me a fire to, to write the rest of my life with his help in a way that I'm fighting for what matters most. And I think today, and I, I think I know today God wants to put that kind of passion inside of you that your, your heart and your mind would re-engage with what matters most. And I, want, I wonder if we could rewrite the rest of the story, what it would say. So I just, I know you're not supposed to do this with the Bible, okay? So please don't make any comments about this is heresy or anything like that. But I just thought, what if, what if the story got rewritten? So we'll start off with the first line. In the springtime, when kings go off to war, David's got a choice. In the springtime, when kings go off to war, David had a choice and you have a choice. In the midst of crisis, in the midst of a difficult season of life, how is the story going to be written? So here's my, here's my little version that I, I wrote up for how it could be written. King David packed up his bags, kissed his wife, rode off into battle, seeking the heart of God. He led them in a great victory with Uriah, by the way, who was Bathsheba's husband. He led them in a great victory, delivering the last blow to the enemy. And all of Israel rejoiced in the faithfulness of God that no longer they would suffer at the hands of their oppressor. That would be a better story, wouldn't it? If that was the story that was written. You know, one of the things I love about the Bible is that it's real and raw as it gets. There, there's no hiding the difficulty, the struggle, and there's a lot of sadness. Th this moment became a huge part of David's story so that it doesn't have to become a part of your story. And I wonder today if you would receive the grace of God to fight for what matters most. Let me, let me ask you this question. What are you fighting for? Are you fighting for your marriage? Are you fighting for your purity? Are you fighting for your relationship with your parents, students? Even those of you who are 14, 15, 16 years old, the choices that you are making right now, your freshman, sophomore, junior, senior year of high school are dramatically shaping the person that you're gonna be 10, 15, 25 years from now. And I wanna encourage you that God wants to put inside of you, like King David when King David was young, a fire, a passion for him that can consume your life, that you fight for what matters most, that you discipline yourself to wake up early and read the Bible and ask God to speak to you and move in power in your life. And I want to encourage you today that you can get a sense of a fight inside of you that causes you each morning to wake up with a sense of purpose. I want to look at the dad who's on the other side of that screen who's 35 years old and you're looking at these three kids around you who are eight, six, and four and you're wondering if it really does matter. I want to tell you it matters. I want to look at you who, the single guy that's by yourself and you're lonely and you're wondering if you staring at images on the computer matter. It does matter. Every image gets stored in your brain and influences every future relationship that you have. I want to look at those of you who are single moms and you're looking at these kids and you're, you're, so, you're so worried about what's happening around you and maybe even distracted with worry and concern, trying to decide if it really does matter. It matters. I want to look at those of you who are students wondering about the decisions that you're making, what you're fighting for. Your choices really do matter. And today is the first day of the rest of your life and you can get a sense of fight inside of you to fight for what matters most. So here's how I'm fighting. I'm fighting for my marriage. I'm fighting for a sense of, of unity in my home. Last Sunday was Mother's Day and um, I... I feel like my wife deserves tremendous amount of honor and about a month before Mother's Day, I felt like God just stirred in my heart, Andy, go above and beyond. Make her breakfast, make her dinner, love on her, give her gifts, b have balloons blown up for her and involve the kids in it. And that I'm just, I'm fighting for her heart. I'm fighting for my kids' hearts. I'm, tr I'm taking time out uh, multiple days a week to individually play with each of my kids so that I can positively engage with them. 
I'm fighting for the future vision of our church that we wouldn't, we wouldn't respond to the crisis and worry when this thing's gonna be over. We're gonna keep trying to reach people for Jesus. We're gonna keep discipling people. We're gonna do something called the Hope Project that's gonna make a huge impact on people's lives. And I wanna encourage you, there, there are things that God wants to stir inside of you. Maybe it's your, your character that you're gonna start waking up early, reading the Bible. Some of you, it's that you're gonna get involved in serving and give your life away so that you can make a difference. All of us, God wants to put inside of you a sense of fight, a passion, in the words of Rocky, the eye of the tiger. How many of you guys ever seen Rocky? That's a, that's a good movie. I've watched it with my kids. Put in the feed if, you, if you're a big Rocky fan. I have a confession. I'm, I'm about to wrap up, but you don't have anywhere to go, so I'm just going to say it like it is. Um, so I have a confession. I love Eye of the Tiger. It's one of my, er, the, one of my favorite songs. And sometimes when I go out for a jog, I listen to Eye of the Tiger, and I get inspired. And I was, I've been watching through the Rocky movies with my boys, my sons. And we watched the first one last year around Christmas time. And then we just recently watched the second one. So in the second one, it comes back, Rocky has lost to Apollo in the first one, but he's lost by a, a narrow, narrow defeat. He actually probably won, but it was, a, you know, one of those ones they call it at the end. And so they call it victory for Apollo. Apollo's like, the best. Rocky's kind of this no-name Philly fighter from this like poor gym. And he comes back in the second movie and he's lost his fight. He's lost his passion. And Mick, who is his trainer, is all up in his face. Probably not the best like encouragement parent techniques, but he just yelling at Rocky, you're worthless, no good piece of trash. There's nothing in you. You're and then at the end of the movie, he's like, there's more in you. So he, he turns his tune and at the end of the movie, Rocky gets in the, the ring again with Apollo, but it's happened because Apollo has been like calling Rocky out saying, I want you to fight. So there's this voice outside saying, Rocky, I want you to get back in the ring. But what he didn't realize is you should not get in the ring a second time with Rocky Balboa. And this time he got in the ring and Rocky took him all the way to the end and knocks him out. It's a great movie. You should go watch it today. He knocks him out last round. He wins the victory. And he made the mistake, Apollo made the mistake of getting in the ring a second time with Rocky. And I love it. I love that, I love that passion that he displayed, that eye of the tiger. And I, I wonder if you would be willing to say to that addiction, you made the mistake of getting in the ring with me a second time. I wonder if you would say to your worry, you made the mistake of getting in the ring one more time. See, God wants to inspire inside of you this passion for him. Romans chapter 12, bring it back up, says, do not conform to the pattern of this world, but be transformed by the renewing of your mind. What God does is he transforms substance so that you are changed from the inside out. The way he does this is that as you cooperate with him by the power of his Holy Spirit, he gives you power within to live the life that he's created you to live. Ephesians chapter uh, 1 verse 19, I love this verse that says, I pray that you will understand the incredible greatness of God's power for us who believe in him. It's the same mighty power that raised Christ Jesus from the dead and seated him in the place of honor at God's right hand in the heavenly realms. That means there's the same power that conquered the grave. If you are in Jesus, if you are following him, lives inside of you, and he wants to give you that power to stand strong, to live the life that he's created you to live by faith in him, in who he is and what he's done. The spirit of God comes inside of you. Ephesians 3, 16 says, and this is my prayer for you, I pray that from his glorious, unlimited resources. He would strengthen you within so that you could live the life that he's created you to live through his spirit inside of you. God wants to give you the power to fight the battle that he has called you to live. What are you fighting for? And may today be the day that you make the choice that you're going to fight for what matters most. Fight for what matters most. And maybe today you're doing it without God's help. Maybe you're doing it on your own power. Today can be the day that you yield your life to Jesus to surrender to him. If that's you, I wanna encourage you right now in this moment to just say, Jesus, I believe that you died on a cross for my sins. I believe that you conquered the grave 
And I want to invite you to take control of my life. In Jesus' name, amen. If you just prayed that prayer to open your heart to God, let us know. Click on that button right there that says that you made a decision to follow Jesus as it comes up. Others of you, there's some really important decisions I want to encourage you to make today. One is, as you heard me allude to in the message, in just four weeks from today, we're starting this massive project as a church called The Hope Project. We're going to be doing a series of messages around hope. It's going to be awesome. Every weekend for seven weekends, it's a 40-day journey together. We're going to look at a letter in the Bible, 1 Peter, a letter of hope. At the same time, we're going to be launching a bunch of groups in our community. Um, And this is a great opportunity for you to get involved in hosting a group. In fact, we're literally aiming to launch hundreds of these groups. Now you may be saying to yourself, how do I host a group without a lot of background spiritually? All you have to do is press play or open up a Zoom link. We'll give you the questions. We're not, you don't have to have theological training. You don't have to have history. You can just simply host a group and there's a link that's gonna come on right now that you can follow to let us know that you'd like to open up your life to be used by God to host a group and let God make a difference through you. There's also at the same time gonna be devotional or daily encouragement that's gonna come out. It's gonna be a great time, but I wanna invite you to help us make a difference. There are gonna be other churches joining in with us on this Hope Project, and simply by being a host, you can make a huge impact. Now, before we wrap up, one last thing, we have an opportunity to give back to God. We call this our generosity moment. This is an opportunity for us to yield our hearts to Jesus and trust him with our resources. One of the reasons why we give is because it reminds us that we're not in control and it's a moment for us to come back and say, God, you are in control of my life. That same passage we looked at today from Romans chapter 12 says um, that we should offer our bodies as living sacrifices before God and that this is a spiritual act of worship. I want to remind you today that when you give, it's a reminder for your heart that surrender is the best posture for life. In fact, in um, John chapter 12, I want you to see this verse. It says, when Jesus was teaching, I tell you the truth, unless a kernel of wheat is planted in the soil and dies, it remains alone, but death will produce many new kernels, a plentiful harvest of new lives. Those who love their life in this world will lose it. Those who care for not care nothing for their life in this world will keep it for all eternity generosity is an opportunity to trust god and let him be in charge of your life sometimes when you let go of money when you choose to give and you choose to trust god with the first of of what you bring in it feels like a death but what god is doing as you surrender any area of your life money your time um, your talents your your giftedness that god is producing in you a harvest that comes out of the death as you release. And I love the regularity for us with generosity that when we trust God, he's birthing new things in us. He's producing new character in us. So I wanna invite you today to ask, who's in charge of my life? Maybe maybe you honestly would say, you know what? God is not in charge. Right now, as we give, I wanna invite you to join us in generosity. It's a great opportunity for you to remind your heart that God is in charge and watch him as he produces a harvest as a result of your obedience and trust in him. I want to pray for you, and then we're going to send it back to our host. And I want to thank you so much for joining us today. I want to encourage you to take this message, go back, write down some thoughts, and begin to apply this message to your life and ask the question, what am I fighting for? What am I fighting for? Jesus, thank you that you give your Holy Spirit to help us fight for what matters most. I pray even now as people give that you would help us fight greed and arrogance and selfishness and desire to control our lives and trust you to be in charge. God, we relinquish control back to you. We give it all to you. Help us now fight for what matters most. In Jesus' name, amen.